Layoffs has hugely increased anxiety among tech workers. Women still experience a lot of underrepresentation, but oftentimes our brains just jump to the worst case scenario, and it might not be true at all. Welcome everyone to our Tech Minds on Wine series. My name is Vidhi Rawal, and today we are joined by Laura. And Laura has a ton to share with us on this episode, so I'm going to jump in directly from here. Uh, hi, Laura. I'm so glad to have you here. Hi, Vidhi. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Can you just kick it off with telling us a bit about your journey so far? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm a licensed therapist. Uh, I'm based in the Denver, Colorado area. Uh, and I have been kind of all over the mental health field, first in very non-tech related areas and have sort of gotten more into the tech space over the years. Um, so I've worked in hospitals. I quickly overnight learned how to shift everything to telehealth like so many other therapists and medical providers across the country, uh, often to tech company employees. And so that's been kind of a part of my journey the last few years. Got it. That's awesome. So you said you enabled a lot of tech employees during mm -hmm. the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, what was that experience like? And were you employed at a mental health and tech startup? Or how did that work go about? Uh, a little of both. Um, so initially in 2020, I was in private practice at that time. Um, and so I had clients from kind of all over the place. Um, and then I started working at um, a tech company that was uh, part time. For, so I was, still had my private practice during that. Um, and was working with them, seeing clients mostly through kind of a, a structured program for de uh, depression and anxiety. Uh, and then after that, I did work full time for a different mental health tech company providing therapy for about a year. Got it. And then you said you also supervised other therapists. So mm -hmm. I believe they also might have a lot of tech clients at the same time. Absolutely. Yes, I have. Uh, I've always had two or three supervisees at any given time. And right now I have six or seven. So yes, they all see a pretty wide population themselves. So yeah, I think we can jump off with talking about the tech industry and mm -hmm. what your feelings are, or like, what have you experienced while helping a lot of techies out and mm -hmm. the common patterns that you've seen so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, some of the patterns that I find in tech can kind of be boiled down to uh, representation and um, what we tend to call imposter syndrome in the mental health space. Um, one is that I do see a lot of uh, kind of first first generation, if you will, not necessarily um, sometimes first generation immigrants, sometimes first generation college students. Um, but oftentimes a lot of tech employees uh, I'm seeing are the first in their family to do this, right? Whether it's branching out into a new industry or whether it is going to college or whether it is kind of a certain income threshold. So that's a really common theme. But I saw Vidi, you raised your hand. That's you too, huh? Yeah. Yeah, me yeah. too. Honestly, okay. All of okay. Them. Yeah, it's a huge thing that shows up in tech. Um, another theme, a theme I see is the anxiety of kind of losing it, um, and I would say losing income, losing status, losing your job, tech layoffs, all of those things. Um, I actually was just reading an article this morning that talked about the phenomenon of regular rich people, um, which is basically a household income threshold of over 175k a year is makes that person or that family in the top 10% of the US. Um, however, so many people that have hit that income threshold still find themselves struggling financially, still find themselves in a lot of student debt, live in expensive cities where 175K doesn't go as far as it should in our minds, right? Um, and so there's often that anxiety of just kind of losing it all and it all crumbling. Um, and then just straight up imposter syndrome comes up too, right? I think that's often related to being a first in your family to do something. Um, and so feeling like you don't belong there, uh, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not, you know, techy enough, if you will, right? You're not innovative enough, whatever it is, right? I see that a lot with people um, who work in tech companies but aren't engineers or UX people, those kinds of things, right? So the HR people at tech companies. Um, I felt that. I was a therapist at a tech company. And so I was very much not involved in the traditional like tech part of the company. And there was often this sort of imposter syndrome um, being there. 
Uh, and the last thing is just representation. Um, the stereotypical tech bro is a, a wealthy, white, you know, late 20s, maybe early 30s kind of bro, right? Male person, right? And so women still experience a lot of underrepresentation, um, people of color, um, people in the LGBTQ plus community, uh, all still experience a significant lack of representation in tech companies, especially at the middle to upper levels. Apparently, the number of females that exist in all the boards and all the tech companies is approximately lesser than 6%, mm-hmm. which is yeah very very low yeah i didn't know that but it's not surprising to me anecdotally yeah yeah um and anything about like layoffs burnout or isolation that has come up in the recent absolutely layoffs has hugely increased anxiety among tech workers um for really legitimate reasons right um it relates to that anxiety of losing it all uh, because when you think about it, if major companies are, you know, lay, laying off hundreds of people at a time, all of those people are now in the job market, again, at the same time, looking for the same positions. So finding an equal position has become increasingly difficult after a layoff. Um, and that's really discouraging for a lot of people. It changes their lifestyle, changes their income. It can be devastating. Um, I was reading an article from Spring Health, which uh, is a mental health company that supports uh, EAP services and works with tech companies, um, that 46% of female employees in tech are reporting high stress compared to 38% of males. Either way, it's a fairly high number, but it's interesting how many more um, women are expressing that high stress in the tech world. Um, And it also stated that two out of five workers show a high risk for burnout, um, which is pretty significant. Have you had clients that have expressed burnout and that in the recent times, or has it always been a trend that you've seen in the tech industry? You know, I think it's always been present, but I do think that the pandemic and has increased it exponentially. Um, I do think that as more and more millennials are parents and are in their mid to late thirties and are trying to um catch up really Uh, you know the millennial generation is the main like workforce right now um but we're not yet the main managers we're not yet the main leaders still it's kind of this thing that millennials are experiencing that we that we have kind of throughout our careers um which is now there's more inflation there's more you know the high cost of living there's more student debt there's all of these things that are preventing millennials from moving into the milestones that previous generations often moved into Um, And that causes a lot of burnout as well. Like, how about we jump more into how you help people cope that Mm -hmm. show all of these patterns? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that I often start with is helping people catch um, what we call thinking traps. Um, This is a pretty common, like, uh, cognitive behavioral technique in the therapy world. But thinking traps are those things that they're very common. They are... uh, incorrect beliefs that pop up for many of us all the time right so it might be just uh they're often anxiety related it might be something like uh your boss calls you in for a meeting right and you don't know the reason it's just a unknown meeting put on your calendar right a thinking trap would be my boss is going to fire me right 100 percent my boss is firing me that's it i'm done i might as well just quit right now i you know i need to just pack my stuff i'm out of here It might not be for that reason at all. There might be no evidence that suggests it's a negative thing, but it's just that jumping to conclusions, right? Um, Catastrophizing, you know, Uh, if you do get a performance evaluation that wasn't quite what you expected, Mm -hmm. okay, well, I'm going to get fired for that, right? Maybe, but maybe not, right? There might be a lot of evidence to show that's not happening at all. Um, Or it might just be things like, you know, Mm -hmm. there are, I said something that I thought was stupid in a meeting and now everyone is thinking about it. Everyone is going to be talking about it. Everyone's going to be making, you know, judgmental remarks at me, right? Those kinds of things. Um, Those are all thinking traps. If there is enough evidence for something, then we might have to accept it as fact. But oftentimes our brains just jump to the worst case scenario and it might not be true at all. Yeah. And do you see a lot of tech people show that they go through a lot of these thinking traps throughout their day? 
I do. Yeah. And it's not just tech people at all. It is everybody. <laughs> um, but certainly there tends to be um, a lot of anxiety in the tech workers that I've worked with. Um, there is a lot of burnout. And so that can lead to more discouraging thought patterns. Right. And so more of those thoughts around um just what's going to happen to my job or, you know, I'm incompetent, I'm stupid, I can't do this. Um, there can also just be things of, you know, this is the worst that it can get. Um, this is the worst case scenario. Uh, other ones I see are like black and white thinking. And so that might be, okay, I had one comment from my boss in, in an entire meeting was negative about my performance. So that means they think uh, my entire performance is negative. My whole year is a waste, right? Nobody thinks that I am capable of doing anything. And that's really black and white, right? And mm -hmm. we kind of take the 1% and miss the 99%. That was a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you help folks from actually not getting into the thinking traps? Like what should they be doing to not mm -hmm. go through that? Yeah. So the first step is to know what they are and to know what yours are in particular, right? To kind of know what your tendencies are so you can catch them more easily. Um, I often teach people a few like just somatic tools at first. Um, it's really easy to uh, just stay in our heads, right? To not get into our bodies and not get into our emotions. And I do see that at kind of a higher rate with tech folks. There's a lot of engineers in tech that tend to be very logical thinkers. And while that's a good thing, um, it means that it can be a little bit harder to connect to our bodies. Um, so one thing that some things that are really easy to do at work, um, sour candy. This is kind of a random one, but literally keep some sour candy on your desk. If you're feeling anxious, that sour flavor can help kind of just activate different sensory experiences in your brain and actually kind of dilute that anxiety a little bit. So sour patch kids, who knew, right? <laughs> That's one. Um, different breathing exercises can be really helpful. Um, I often teach people what I call ice cream breathing. Um, it's actually uh, diaphragm breathing, but ice cream breathing is easier to remember. Um, so if you, you know, if you think about uh, having a, a scoop of three scoops of ice cream, right? You go to an ice cream shop and they scoop it on scoop one, scoop two, scoop three, right? But when you eat it, you're probably going to eat three, two, one, top to bottom now. And that's how we breathe for ice cream breathing. So you would take a deep breath and fill up that diaphragm abdomen area first and then fill up your lungs in the same breath and then keep going and then fill up your throat last. Then when you breathe out, you go the opposite way. You release the air from your throat first and then from your lungs and then from your abdomen. Um, and that's a way to really help slow your body down quickly. Um, another one is just cold, cold sensations, right? Um, I've had plenty of folks that have gone back to the office uh, and just keep a cold can of soda in, their, in the office fridge they may or may not ever drink it, but they just use it to put up against their neck, you know, or their chest or something like that, because that cold sensation can really help bring the anxiety down as well. Yeah, yeah. All And all of those are easy ones that you can do at work, right, which is often when a lot of people's anxiety comes up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so burnout is a little bit more of a long-term journey, if you will. Um, I often expand kind of the idea of those sensory things. I expanded to what's called polyvagal theory when we start talking about burnout. Polyvagal theory is uh, essentially uh, about our nervous system. So we, most of us are familiar with the idea of being in fight or flight or uh, kind of rest and digest, right? The sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. But if polyvagal theory gets into the fact that actually the vagus nerve, which is the parasympathetic side of the system, actually has two branches, the ventral branch and the dorsal branch. Um, and one is the more uh, primitive side. It's like a light switch. It's on or it's off, right? That's it. More the lizard brain, if you will. Um, the other branch of the parasympathetic nervous system is like a dimmer switch. 
it's where now we have a lot more control of kind of going up slowly or down slowly or stopping anywhere in the middle, right? That's the more advanced human side of the parasympathetic nervous system. So polyvagal theory gets into that. One side is more of what we just kind of think of as calm, right? It's calm, it's regulated, it's happy, you know, uh, we can kind of manage everything effectively in that space. And the other side is the flip up and down, right? We often think about that space as kind of just shut down, right? Because when the parasympathetic nervous system goes into overdrive, we just shut down completely, right? It doesn't just take us out of fight or flight, it takes us right all the way down. And that's not really helpful either. Um, polyvagal theory is about learning to recognize what your body feels like in all of these different stages, right? So there's shutdown, there's freeze, there's fight or flight, um, and then there's also kind of in-between stages like play, like relaxation, kind of con contemplative stages, right? And then finally there at the top is that space where you can be kind of regulated, happy, and thriving. Um, learning how you react in all of those kind of rungs of the polyvagal ladder is a really important step into learning what to do when you find yourself on a, in a space that you don't want to be in. Very interesting. And then how have you seen people apply this? Like any mm -hmm. real life examples that mm -hmm. you have of this? Yeah. So those examples of like sour candy and cold, that's essentially assuming that a person's in fight or flight, right? When we're in fight or flight, we're overly amped up. And that's often what the typical anxiety feels like, right? You might be hyperventilating. You might find yourself with some anger and frustration. Your heart's beating faster. Your thoughts are racing. we got to slow stuff down. So think about slow, think about cold, think about deep breathing, all of those kinds of things to kind of help bring your nervous system back down. Now, if you're in more of a freeze place, freeze is, um, it is what it sounds like, right? And so it might just not be not knowing what to do, overwhelm, right? Just this intense like uh, analysis paralysis, if you've heard that phrase before. In freeze, we have to warm ourselves back up, right? So now you might want to drink hot coffee on a hot day, right? You might want to go outside. You might want to splash some hot water on your face. You might want to um, do even like running in place, right? You know, get your body moving. Do some like more intense breathing, you know, that kind of is not hyperventilating, but more of a, right, to get your air flowing through your body. Freeze is just the opposite. Now you want to speed things up. You want to heat up your body. You want to kick your nervous system back into action. Um, and if we kind of go all the way down to shut down, that's pretty similar techniques. It's also about warming yourself up. It's about kind of uh, bringing yourself back to life, if you will. Um, and so really, if all you remember about polyvagal theory is that when you are amped up, you got to slow it down and cool it down. And if you are frozen or shut down, you have to heat up and speed up that can go a long way in itself yeah and then how would you say people who have like experienced serious burnout or are very almost like done with their work to go through that i'm pretty sure there's something beyond the pvg theory as well for them to get back up in life yeah yeah so when it comes to pretty serious burnout i think the first thing you have to do is remove the stuff making burnout worse that's external stuff usually. So whether it's something like changing your schedule, reducing your workload, uh, quitting your job, uh, you know, reducing other outside pressures, you know, we have to get rid of the stuff that is piling on in order to create the burnout, right? If you don't, you can't really get out of it. You all, the best you can do is try to like maintain yourself at this level without making it worse, but it's not going to get better. We have to make a lot of really tough choices with burnout in order to get out of it. Once you have kind of cleared away the tough stuff, you got to get to the root of where it was coming from in the first place. And so whether that was just, it could have just been a job, right? Overworked, underpaid, overwhelmed, right? It might be that. It might be something like vicarious trauma. It might be something like it's just experiencing um, harassment, discrimination in the workplace, which is also trauma all of those things. Um, so you got to get to the root and kind of understand what's going on and what you need to change in order to find some relief from that, right? 
Yeah. And I believe all of these major decisions, I feel like folks sometimes know they need to do it, but Mm -hmm. they just haven't been able to process and Mm -hmm. have had the patience to get till there. So they just Mm -hmm. avoid doing that. Absolutely. How do you help them get patience and like help them process to finally get there and make that decision? Yeah. Well, I think we do have to just get real about what the trajectory of burnout looks like, right? And so there's, it's often true that people, and you know, in tech, this happens a lot. People are very reluctant to make waves. They're reluctant to quit their jobs. They're reluctant to do anything different for all of those things we talked about at the beginning, right? This might be a huge achievement for them. Their whole family is counting on them, right? Or they've made more money than they can imagine making in a different field. All of those things, right? It's very real. And that makes it really difficult for people to make those big changes. When that happens, I understand, I get that, but I say we have to start small, right? You cannot stay in the same situation you've been in and heal the burnout. So maybe it means adjusting your schedule. Maybe it means talking to your manager about dropping one particular project. Maybe it means reducing the number of meetings. Maybe it means you simply take your email off your phone at the after hours, right? Or all the time, <laughs> you know, it can, there can be really small steps. Make sure that you're taking breaks. Make sure you're eating lunch, right? Find other things you can do outside of work that you're really passionate about. Get, you know, make sure you're taking some self-care time. I, I always try to be careful about the self-care recommendation, Because yes, it's important, and if you are getting beaten down at work every single day, it is not going to fix it. And so self-care is essential and it's important, but you can't see that as that's going to fix everything, right? Mm -hmm. You have to make other changes and advocate for yourself and your health in order to really conquer burnout. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks for sharing that. I feel like now we can center back to the earlier conversation where you were talking about immigrants and the people who are like the first generationals um, getting into the industry. So how, what are the patterns that you've seen with them? If they are, if there's anything different than whatever we've discussed and then how do you help them cope with those? Yeah. Uh, I tend to see more burnout, to be honest, and I think that is often due to family pressure, um, self-internal pressure, right, Uh, and just the drive that you have to be successful um, to make all of those experiences worth it, if you will. Um, I find it's also, uh, it can be harder to talk through the experience and the emotions really honestly. Um, A lot of times, uh, you know, Many immigrants are taught kind of growing up that they need to just kind of grin and bear it, right? Be grateful, grin and bear it, deal with it, don't complain. Those sorts of things can come up. Um, And while there are uh, appropriate situations for that, right, there's a lot of resilience there. There's also then sometimes people who end up forcing themselves to suffer a lot more than they need to. Um, And so I often have to be a little bit more gentle, compassionate, and kind of slow going when it comes to helping people in burnout get to the point where they can make those choices that are really going to help them heal. Yeah. And anything else that you'd like to cover for ways that you help people cope? I think the only other one would just be that all of us, and, and definitely again in tech tech world, we can work on our emotional intelligence, right? Um. It's just about learning to identify your own emotions and communicate those effectively to the people around you. Um, Emotional intelligence is often not valued in tech. And so we learn to just be doers. You learn to be able to accomplish all these tasks, work under high pressure, work in these very dynamic environments, right? Um, All of those kinds of things and those buzzwords. And emotional intelligence is not particularly valued. Um, Emotional intelligence means that you can express yourself. You can identify your needs. You can um, be able to communicate that to the people you love and to people at work as well, right? The lack of emotional intelligence often when related to burnout often results in somebody who completely crashes and burns and loses their whole career because they were not willing to make that change earlier before it got that bad. 
Yeah, no, that's very true. I feel mm-hmm. like a lot of us yeah. could yeah. actually get some side skills on emotional intelligence and how it's supposed to work in the workplace at least. All right. Anything else that you think that could help listeners who are looking for tools to get through their everyday stress and yeah, life concern? Probably not that I would be able to just kind of share as like blanket tips, but I would say find a good therapist. (laughs) Find a good therapist that can help you identify your particular triggers, your particular work situation, your level of emotional intelligence, where you tend to land on the polyvagal ladder. Find somebody that can help you apply these strategies to your unique experience. There are a lot of apps, meditation apps Mm -hmm. that get used and a Mm -hmm. lot of journaling apps and basically tech Mm industries like only apps. So do you have any thoughts around the usage of those apps and anything that you'd have to say in there? Uh, Any mental health related app is useful if you use it and if you recognize its limits, right? If you use an app that helps you journal, fantastic. It's probably not going to be the one thing that fixes your mental health. If you have an app that helps you meditate, also fantastic. Could be a really useful, good practice in your life. Probably won't be the one thing that fixes your mental health, right? Um, And so I think recognize apps are as helpful as you make them and they don't replace the relational human aspect of therapy. Do both. Got it. Okay. Awesome. I think this has been a very enlightening conversation for me personally, especially being a first generational immigrant and realizing and feeling validated at some point. So thank you for this, Laura. I'm pretty sure listeners are going to be relate to everything that you've mentioned and apply these tools to their day-to-day life, hopefully. 